do 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 Good morning and welcome back to day two of OER Domains 21. I hope you're enjoying your morning so far. Um, I would like to uh, welcome for this session, Dr. Rob Farrow of the Institute for of In Educational Technology at the Open University. Rob is going to be talking about understanding OER and innovation. Just before Rob speaks, I'd like to remind you to use the chat area for any comments you have or any questions. And at the end of the session, we'll come back to those and we'll put those to Rob. So without any further delay, I'd like to uh, hand over to Rob Farrow. Thank you very much. Hi, yeah, thanks very much. Um, so uh, I'm gonna be talking with you this morning about innovation and OER. And uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm a senior researcher at the Institute of Educa Educational Technology at the Open University in the UK. Uh, the OU has um, a history of innovation in distance education, which I'm sure you're all aware of. Um, and uh, also in open education um, as well, um, through OER and through sort of open practices and that kind of thing. Um, and so the sort of motivating question for this work, which relates to a project uh, which I'm going to be talking about at the end, is trying to understand what innovation looks like in an open educational context um, and my sort of starting point for this is you, you might start off by thinking well obviously OER are an innovation they let us do things like the five R's and they give us new possibilities for action and uh, coordination and that kind of thing but I think it's important to note that uh, copyright which OER is a sort of response to was also an innovation um, and it was designed to sort of solve the problem of how to regulate intellectual property uh, once mechanical uh, reproduction became possible. So how do we incentivize creativity? How do we preserve works? How do we establish the rules for economic exploitation and so on? So, um, so OER is, is, is a response to that, but it's not like uh, against the backdrop where there's no innovation in anything else or something like that. Um, and I think uh, it's not always easy to understand exactly what we mean by innovation per se, but it's especially complex in an open uh, uh, context because a lot of the uh, challenges associated with openness make it hard to be uh, very systematic and, and kind of categorical about innovation. Uh, there's a recent paper, which is well worth reading, which is a review of um, innovation in open education. Um, which you can find in the journal Sustainability. And this uh, highlights some things which I wanted to kind of pass on around this uh, idea of openness. Uh, one is that um, people still tend to think about uh, formal models of innovation uh, with respect to traditional education and traditional institutions of education. And a lot of the time, the sort of open response doesn't necessarily fit into the existing uh, way of doing things, although it can do, and I'm going to talk about that in a second. Um, the other is the kind of the sort of synthesis issue, if you like. Of we've got all these different kind of things going on that we call open. How do we bring them all together into one area, and how do we kind of understand them together as openness? And also that the kind of things that um, uh, support innovation, the, the dynamism um, and the uh, potential of open practices. Uh, in a way, that's the sort of engine that drives the innovative aspects, but it also makes it hard to be very general about what's going on. And uh, if you're familiar with Martin Weller's work, he's made a, a sort of uh, argument about openness and the difficulty of being categorical in general because uh, how diverse context uh, can be and how important context is for understanding openness. Um, and in addition to this, you've got the idea of openness being something related to technology and technique, um, but also that it's a sort of human element and it's about uh, outlook, mindset, values, and so on. So all the things that are kind of coming together um, uh, in innovation in open educational context. Uh, so I wanted to, so, so 
just looking back now at some of the work that I've been involved with and trying to sort of distill out what is the innovation element of this, which wasn't necessarily the focus at the time. Um, so you, you may be familiar with the Open Education Research Hub, uh, which is uh, the team that I'm part of. Um, now, a few years ago, when we first came together, we did some um, uh, the first sort of global um, research into uh, the impact of OER. And we worked with a whole bunch of different um, collaborators. Uh, you can see them here. Uh, and the way this research was organized was that we had a series of hypotheses that we were investigating. Um, and you can see these here. Each one had a sort of keyword to summarize it. Um, but we were interested in, at the time in examining what's the evidence base for the claims that people are making about OER. So people are saying it saves money, for instance. Well, where's the evidence for that? And so on. So, um, but in this case, I think this is this is an, a sort of a useful shorthand for the sort of innovations associated with OER, at least in 2012. Um, you can read the reports yourselves if you want to find out what the outcome of that research was. Um, so with uh, OER Research Hub, uh, it was all about the key claims. And so if you like, those were the innovations that we were investigating. There's also some innovation in the way that we were investigating it by using open practices and, and open dissemination and, and so on. Um, but similarly, looking at other projects, so UK Open Textbooks, the innovation is to replace textbooks with open licensed versions, supporting the kind of pedagogical change and making certain things more efficient and, and so on. Um, uh, creating the right kind of critical reflection, that sort of thing. Um, and so in other projects like BizMOOC, we had the idea of uh, leveraging MOOCs for business training, OER World Map, the idea of using open data and open kind of protocols to share data and experiences amongst open education communities. Um, with the Go Global uh, OER Graduate Network, GoGN, uh, we're quite interested there in the kind of uh, the, the, the open vector into research. So what's the, what's the impact of open on what people are doing? How do you, uh, how do you practice openly? How do you become an open researcher and so on? Um, so, so that just gives you, I think, a flavor of the different sort of manifestations of, of innovation. And that's just a very, very, you know, lightweight kind of look back at a few projects. Uh, looking at more theoretical accounts of innovation and trying to understand it more theoretically, uh, a lot of people will start off with the idea of, oh, well, someone's the first person to think of something and do something differently. They're the innovator. They're the ones that people follow. Um, and there's, there's some truth to that. But the idea of, you know, I've used Archimedes here, um, discovering that you can measure irregular or the volume of irregular bodies by displacement in water, shouting Eureka. And, you know, it's the moment of innovation, if you like. Uh, um, if you actually look at um, sort of modern theories around innovation, uh, m not many of them would really agree with that as a kind of uh, idea of how innovation spreads. If you look at the task artifact cycle, the idea here is that we we develop um, new tools to meet the challenges, new challenges come out, we need new tools and so on. So it's always iterative. Um, and this iterative model is not like the Eureka model, really. And uh, there might be a Eureka moment at some point, but it's really about how these things spread um, uh, that makes them, you know, a kind of lasting innovation, sustainable innovation. Uh, uh, Rogers did some work around how innovations spread. And in a way, the interesting thing here, I think, is if an innovation doesn't spread, it almost wasn't an innovation. Right? It's almost like um, the sort of the public decides what's innovative and what's not. Um, but here you see a sort of standard uh, deviation curve, which um, that's showing you uh, how many people are adopting at a particular point and the uh, sort of yellow gold line is uh, how many people have adopted as a whole. So you always have the sort of the initial thing of the innovators and the early adopters, um, and most people aren't on board at that point. And I invite you to think at, the, at this point, where is OER in this uh, market share um, graphic? Uh, in fact, um, OER has a 5% market share in K-12 in the USA, which is one of the more sort of advanced um, spreads or proliferations of OER in a particular educational market. 5% is not much. It puts you pretty low on this uh, scale. 
Um, and in most places, you wouldn't even be close to 5%, right? And um, one thing that's worth noting about this graph is that in the early adoption phase, there's a kind of chasm of, of peril where uh, things can, can kind of fail at that point. So they don't get enough um, critical mass around adoption. Kind of interesting, I'm, I'm not sure with this one and the one before, how much it helped us to understand openness specifically, because they're really more about how things spread and how they iterate, um, which maybe describes quite well OER itself and how that changes and how that you know adapted and so on. Um, but innovation as a whole is maybe more complicated. Uh, another framework uh, that you might be already familiar with, SAMR or SAMIR model for technology integration. And this is a kind of progressive thing. So the first use of a, a, a new tool or technology might be that you substitute it for the existing tool. Um, then later on, you improve that substituted tool, make more improvements, uh, make it better at something. Um, the next stage would be modification. So eventually, you can get some sort of redesign of the task. And finally, you can rethink entirely the whole process because you've reached a certain point where you've transformed the, the task or the challenge. Um, now, if you map this onto, for instance, open textbooks, I think it's quite interesting. Uh, and I think this, this actually uh, maps quite well onto the sort of spectrum of what you might do with OER. Um, so first of all, substitution, quite simple. You use the open textbook instead of the commercial textbook. Uh, augmentation, you can then share that in ways you couldn't share it before, maybe because of digital, maybe not, maybe because of copyright. Um, you also make it cheaper for learners and so on. Um, mo at modification uh, stages, you might do remixing, you might do re-editions, you might collaborate across institutions to improve things. Um, at the re redefinition stage, you might rethink textbook completely. You know, why, why have a textbook at all? Um, so I, I see some potential here for sort of mapping this stuff uh, and different um, different sort of uh, instances of, of OER and open education. Uh, if you were to develop it a bit further, so this is this is from mobile learning. Um, but someone's uh, categorized particular studies along this Samir kind of um, categories. And I think this has potential as well for um, understanding and explaining what's happening with open resources and open practices. Um, there aren't many studies which actually look at innovation as a specific thing in um, open education. Uh, I was involved with one uh, where we went back after a project had ended and we tried to understand, okay, so what was the innovation really like then? You know, what was happening that we didn't necessarily appreciate at the time or already comes out later through reflection and that kind of thing. Um, now, what I, would, what I would say about this, um, if, it's a, if it's a model, I'm not sure, it's, it's kind of messy, right, when you start looking at reality. <laughs> so reality is much messier than a nice, neat set of categories. Um, but it does get you closer to understanding what really happened in that instance, what happened in that, exact, in that particular example. Um, so I don't really have time to develop these arguments today, but I have some thoughts around how we support innovation through uh, OER. Um, and so this is, if you like, the more practical end of this stuff for me. Um, so raising awareness of open, uh, concentrating on empowering individuals, encouraging experimentation, develop uh, critical and constructive learning cultures, thinking and acting at the level of the ecosystem and building and leveraging networks. This is a kind of provisional list, I suppose. Um, I don't really have time to go into it. Uh, this is coming out of some other work that I've done around, um, for instance, critical pedagogy, um, ethics and so on. Um, I put the references in here in case you wanna look up more of that or you wanna drop me a line about it. So why am I doing all this stuff talking about um, innovation anyway? So uh, I want to tell you um, briefly about um, a new project um, that's uh, just started this year, Encore Plus. Encore is the European Network for Catalyzing Open Resources in Education, a knowledge alliance project funded until 2023. Uh, so I won't go through the list of collaborators, but you can see them here on the slide. Uh, so what's the point of the project? The idea is to create a coordinated area within Europe for innovation through open educational resources. And the idea here is that we will uh, build these communities, facilitate their interactions, um, but also come up with formal strategies around um, 
business models, integration for, of OER and academia, and how in the world of work we can have um, better use of open uh, resources and open practices. Uh, so you can see here the sort of high level um, concept behind the project. So f firstly, there's this idea of um, creating these the, the correct sort of communities. And then we have the idea of how do we improve the quality? How do we build the right sort of technological infrastructure? How do we create the right policies and recommend um, them to the right people and so on? Um, and the one that, that uh, I'm focusing on today is really this, uh, this one about validated innovation and business models for OER. Um, on the business model side, um, I'm going to be drawing on some work from a couple of years ago on the UFAT project that's open, online, flexible, and technology enhanced uh, models. So uh, we did some work um, a couple of years ago where we did surveys around the world to try and kind of understand how provision differed in different countries and different institutions. And on the business model side, one common thing you can, uh, one an form of analysis is to sort of say, who's got more of a defender-like approach and who's more like a prospector. So defenders are interested in protecting what they've got and prospectors are trying to create something new. And they're more obviously associated with um, innovation as a core concern. So we're gonna be looking at different business models and how they map onto uh, innovation. Um, but depending on, so this is again from the UFAT project, depending on how you uh, collect that data, you can map lots of different um, lots of different criteria. So how open someone is, what kind of business model they've got. And this doesn't have to necessarily just apply to educational institutions. You could do it with businesses as well and people who exist in that kind of middle space. Um, there is a theory of open innovation, which you may but not be familiar with. Uh, it's the idea that contrary to traditional forms of um, innovation within a corporation or business, the idea is that you have a porous kind of uh, approach where Academia is involved, there's alternative markets, and it's a bit more, you know, what we, what we would call an open practice. So I think this is also an interesting thing to look at. Um, and I just want to finish off by telling you about the kind of work that we're going to be doing within Encore that's relevant to innovation. So first of all, refining some of these thoughts into more of an innovation model, and then building a tool for evaluation and recording examples of innovation. And when we find these cases where people are doing something interesting, the idea is to amplify those across the network and um, raise the profile, but also extract the kind of key elements from it. Um, and so there's a desk research element, and there's also sort of a series of events that we'll be doing. Um, and just looking to the sort of timeline for this, so month six will be June this year. That will be the first of our briefings. So there'll be um, uh, briefing documents. There'll be six of those across the course of the project which summarize some of the theoretical stuff, some of the examples that we're finding, and kind of give you a very sort of quick overview of innovation in the last sort of six months. Uh, we'll also be publishing a toolkit to help people understand innovation in their own context. And then um, throughout the life of the project, we have these circles. And so the first circle is in month 10. These are our community of practice meetings where we'll be bringing people together, not just for, with an interest in innovation, but also later on in the project, people interested in quality, technology, policy, and so on each have their own circle, which will come together into one big community by the end of the project. And so there'll be various sort of things online, showcases, and um, bits of interesting content. I strongly recommend you to sign up to the mailing list at encoreproject.eu, um, where you'll be able to find more information about the project. Um, but I hope you will join us as we are exploring innovation in this way. Um, thanks very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Rob, uh, for a fascinating presentation. Um, we don't have a lot of time for questions. Um, maybe just pose this one from Neil. Um, just uh, if you could maybe quickly reflect on what you think of some of the criticisms that Nancy Ettlinger makes of open innovation. Um, which criticisms are they? Oh, um, <laughs> oh, I have not read that book. I don't know. That's okay. Thanks very much. <laughs> We're nearly out of time anyway, but um, so I think, um, thank you very, for a very interesting talk. And uh, the comments bar has been very active. So you might want to ref look at those later. Um, but I'd just like to thank you once again for your presentation today and thank everyone for 
Oh, uh, one more. Rob, could you give the link again to get in the Encore mailing list? Maybe we could um, yeah, share that. So it's just encoreproject.eu. Encoreproject.eu. Fabulous. And I'm going to take that reference, that ex-linear reference, and I'm going to have a look at it. Uh, so thanks for that. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks everyone for coming and uh, thank you, Rob, once again. Thank you. <laughs> um, nom nom.